some openings define chess players. I've got to say that easily my favorite opening against 1e4 has been the Alakine defense. And it was a privilege to be the first author on Chessable to have a text on the Alakine. And I, I got to do the shout out thing to, you know, big fan of comics and Batman and whatnot. So, Alakine Defense, The Dark Knight Rises. And I've got a little bit of an update in this video because I like to follow all of the players who frequently play the Alakine and mention in my text on a regular basis. Grandmaster Bortnik is the foremost expert in the world on the Alakine and playing it regularly. And also I'm seeing another name that pops up quite frequently, Grandmaster Naroditsky. I'm going to share some of the ideas that have been popping up in their Title Tuesday games against the most difficult theoretical line versus the Alakine, the Four Pawns Attack. Now, in my book, I have multiple options, and it's still, even though there are other texts, it is the most critical text, and it goes through the most alternatives compared to all of the other books on Chessable that cover the Alakine. Now, I do feel that black can equalize in every line, but the four pawns, it's tough. And anytime there's a new idea, it really gets my attention because I went through these lines critically with a fine tooth comb. And lo and behold, these top players just keep surprising me with new ideas. And this particular, or should I say specific move order with bishop f5, gives white a lot of room to go wrong. Now, whether it be bishop e3 or knight c3, we're going to get the main line that we're taking a look at. The only line that I feel that can consistently pose practical problems for black and gives white, you know, that nagging first move edge is with move 7, knight f3. We're going to start there. Now, after e6, knight c3, this is the branching point. Now, Narditsky and Bortnik in blitz games have been playing bishop b4. And I started there and saying, okay, this could be an interesting new universal approach to playing against the four pawns attack. But sadly, when looking at it with modern engines, I've got bishop d3, c5, this very strong in-between move that has only occurred in one or two games. Now we take, and knight takes f5. White has a substantial advantage, so this line just isn't playable, and they're getting away with it because players aren't prepared for it yet. They will be soon, though, and that's, that's the thing about creative players like Bortnik and Naroditsky. They will play things that can objectively be incorrect because they know with that same type of gambling mindset when to bluff and when not to, and that's one of the things that makes them fantastic players. So after knight c3, you've got the more classical approach, which I have recommended in the text now, with f6, followed by castles. And after a game that Naroditsky had against Ray Robson in the last U.S. Championship, he analyzed the game deeply on one of his streams. It's tough for black in these positions. So I was looking for something a little bit different, a little bit new, and found a correspondence game. And correspondence games I typically really like as it's engine versus engine action with two competent players, move by move, just really working hard to get to a pure evaluation of the position. And Nakamura has also played this move order with the wasted tempo bishop g4, followed by queen d7. And instead of castling queenside, which had been seen in the past, I do really like this move, rook d8. If you commit the king to the queenside, very often white's going to be able to play c5 and then b4 at the right moment, and it's just a vicious attack. This is far more solid and far more reputable. So after c5... 
we trade a bit, and we look like we're in trouble on the f-file, but we're just in time to hold everything together with knight d8. And though we're a bit cramped, I do feel, especially in a practical game, this is going to be quite difficult for white to win, because you're going to have to consider moves like knight f6. After takes, takes, e5, and black holds it together without too much difficulty. Just don't allow the mate. <laughs> and after bishop f2, the trade down and a repetition takes place. So I do feel that this line is holding it together for black in the four pawns against the most dangerous move seven, knight f3. Now let's take a look at the new theory that's being you know, the Trailblazers, Bortnik and Narditsky against seven knight c3 as well as seven bishop e3, which will be a transposition. We're first going to go e6, and there we are, the two most natural moves. We get bishop b4, and bishop b4 is definitely a move that's been tested by Bortnik in the past, but it's with a different move order with the knight already committed to c6. By using this move order, we have the extra option after move 9, knight f3 to play c5. And this is where it gets fun. a3 takes, and let's look at the branches that have taken place in some of these titled Tuesday games. Well, if queen takes d4, we'll trade. Go knight c6, go long, play knight a4 to bother the bishop, and after bishop d3, White's bishop pair advantage is going away. That e-pawn is quite weak. Black already has a nagging edge and went on to win in a game from actually 2004. So Bortnik's been hiding these great ideas from us for so long in plain sight. So after c takes d4, if bishop takes d4, simply go back to e7, knight d5, and I'm loving seeing the overextension of these pawns, which will likely become weak later. We're not in the trading business unless you trade on our terms. Bortnik picks up a little time there with the queen maneuver. Back to castle queenside, which is a deviation and improvement on a title Tuesday game that Bortnik won. Black has steady and stable edge here. Now, lastly, I've got an example game with a takes b4, which is likely the most critical move. We're getting white's bishop as well, and after takes takes c5. This is one of the few improvements I could find on Bortnik's play, even in blitz. He's just an absolute monster. What can you do? So he played knight d5 in the game, and white missed an opportunity. Knight 6 to d7 is more accurate, followed by bishop g4 and king e7, where we have a small plus as we have no identifiable weaknesses and we're able to play against the e-pawn at a future juncture. So after c5, knight d5, castle queenside, takes, takes, and black's already out of trouble trading into this end game. And Bortnik's technique is quite nice, so we'll finish off the video going through the rest of this game. Rook h to d8. Do we want to take and fix their structure? No, we want to break down the structure. a5. Let's get rid of the c-pawn so we can undermine the defense of that rook on d6. And after c6, finally we get what we want. Take again. Not letting that pass pawn get more dangerous. Bortnik just gradually makes it look so easy to play at a high level. Bishop e6. When you're up material trade down, simplify the win. You bother the weakness, we defend it. Bother the weakness. I don't just want to push the pawn. I want to stay flexible. Rook b7. Pass pawns must be pushed. You can have the a pawn. I want a better prize on the g-file. Rook f2. Only now g5 because we want the rook to be flexible attacking weaknesses. Good technique. Trade a set of pawns. 
get the king and pawn closer to the finish line. E2. Now the king's going after another one. And Bortnick clearly had seen this in game before because we're able to keep the king far enough away. Well, we have a very nice idea here. We give back the pawn, rook b1, and since the king is too far away, it needs to be here, you can simply walk away where eventually checks run out, and if you come back, I simply push the pawn, and it ends with king and rook checkmate. So hopefully you've enjoyed this update in theory with the four pawns attack of the Alakine. I think this is a, a fantastic idea that's kind of surfacing, or resurfacing, I should say, in the games of Bortnik and Naroditsky. And Alakine is still viable, still interesting. At multiple levels, it has to be stated that players are only facing these two. King Pawn and Sicilian, followed closely by the next tier with French and Karo Khan. So when we go one more tier after that, the Alakine's somewhere in there. So it has a lot of surprise value, and if you know it well, you can put your opponent on the back foot. It's why it's one of my favorite openings, and you get dynamic and interesting positions. And to use a term that's been put on me as an author for the way that I write. I'm nettlesome. <laughs> the opening's nettlesome. So have some fun with it. Try it out.